Hello there. Uh, this is Asen Hussein, uh, assistant professor at uh, Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, at the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences. I'm going to be presenting my case to you today. Uh, and uh, this is a very common condition which we all see in oculoplastic clinics. Uh, I'll just give you a moment to look at this gentleman's face and think about um, uh, what you're seeing here and how you would examine him. So this is a uh, lower eyelid ectropion. This is an eyelid malposition in which the eyelid margin is turned away from its normal apposition to the globe. And you can see that it's worse as on the patient's right compared to the patient's left. Uh, very commonly on the, occurs on the lower eyelid, mainly because of one, uh, the effects of gravity, but also uh, sun damage and the changes in the skin uh, can do this too. Um, upper eyelid ectropion can, of course, occur as well, but usually associated with other underlying um, uh, uh, pathophysiology. Now, um, uh, lower eyelid ectropion can be classified really into um, four types. Uh, there, well, actually five types, but I'll give you the main four, which are involutional, cisatricial, paralytic, and mechanical. There is a fifth category, which is congenital, extremely rare, but congenital ectropion of the eyelids can occur. Um, it should be recognized that, however, that more than one etiology can be present in the same patient. So, for example, a patient with a chronic facial nerve palsy, uh, uh, an older patient may also have involutional factors uh, 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 contributing to their condition. Uh, when it occurs in the upper eyelid, uh, although this is less common, it's usually associated with things like eyelid trauma, herpes zoster ophthalmicus, ichthyosis, and burn injuries. So why is it important to classify ectropion? I mean, people say, well, are you not going to do the same operation for every ectropion? Actually, that's not correct. Your operation should be guided by the unique uh, a pattern of disease that every individual patient presents to you. And that's really the best way of achieving success. Uh, you'll find that if you apply the same management strategy to every patient, your success rate will start to decline over time. Um, so the treatment should be always guided to the underlying cause. And involutional ectropion is by far the most common. However, cisatricial causes are overlooked. And in this gentleman, it's something I want to highlight, which we'll come to. Uh, because um, if a, a patient has a cisatricial cause, you will need to perform uh, additional procedures such as a full thickness skin graft or a mid facelift or the use of uh, spacers or soft tissue expanders to uh, uh, correct their condition. And a failure of this uh, leads to poor surgical outcomes. So the initial sign of a lower uh, lid ectropion could actually be a punctal eversion. And uh, that can actually be the earliest sign of a patient developing uh, a lower lid ectropion. And that's something not to be overlooked if a patient presents with tearing from their eye. So um, I'm just gonna move on to patient evaluation. So uh, first of all, the history, very important to ask about dermatological disorders. Does the patient have a history of eczema, uh, lamellar ichthyosis? You should ask about a drug history, uh, particularly topical medications which the patient might be using, um, or uh, the patient may have an allergy to uh, something which uh, has caused the skin change. Uh, for example, a patient may develop an allergy to glaucoma medications, and of course those run down the face and can affect the skin and cause their lid to start to turn out. And that is actually not a very uncommon cause of uh, lowered electropion and should be uh, 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 discussed. Another thing to think about is a patient who's had surgery to their lids before, such as a blepharoplasty, laser skin surfacing, or a chemical peel, uh, which can of course uh, also cause lower lid ectropia. Um, when you look at the patient, you again want to look at the whole face, look at the skin changes around their face. Do they have any scars? Do they have any skin deficiency? Do they have rosacea? Uh, assess their cranial nerve function to check particularly, of course, the seventh nerve. Is there any facial weakness? Are there any malignancies that you can see on the skin? So for example, uh, are, can you see a basal cell carcinoma maybe, or a suspicious change in the skin, which is actually causing a mechanical change and uh, lower lid ectropion? Then you will proceed to actually uh, your manual kind of uh, examination. 
And one thing I would do in this patient is first of all, also ask them to look up and open their mouth. And you might be able to tell subtly that there is a slight worsening, particularly on the left side of his ectropion when he looks up and opens his mouth. And that kind of confirms to us that there is a cisatricial component at play here as well. Um, in fact, uh, we'll come to a picture here where a Q-tip is being used in the same patient to try to roll that lid back in toward his eye. In fact, it's not going in. It's actually staying where it is. And why is that? It's because you can see the tension lines in the skin. There's just not enough uh, anterior lamella for that lid to flop back into place. So you will need to perform an additional procedure in this patient. You then want to also check on laxity of the lid. You want to do a snap, uh, snap back test. You want to do a pinch test where you grab the lid and see uh, gently how uh, uh, lax it is and how quickly it goes back to the globe. You also want to perform a lateral distraction test and see if the medial uh, canthal tendon or the lateral canthal tendons are actually um, uh, 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 displaced or uh, uh, lax. Um, and these are all very important um, uh, things to do before you manage the patient. And how do you manage the patient? Well, first of all, address the underlying cause. So in this patient, like I mentioned, you'll need to probably do a full thickness skin graft. Um, and before we come to that, though, before we come to surgery, you may actually want to ask the patient about, you know, their skin underlying skin condition. How is that managed? Do they have a dermatologist? You may want to speak to their glaucoma surgeon about changing their drops and uh, maybe using a preservative free preparation. Uh, or maybe I have had some patients who actually have a very subtle lower lid ectropion, and you can actually ask them to massage very gently some steroid ointment like Tobradex or dexamethasone ointment on the skin of the lid and massage the lid upwards. They do that for uh, a month or two months, and I've had a couple of patients have enough of an improvement that they don't need surgery. And then, of course, move on to the, um, uh, the surgical options. So whenever, let's come back to you know how you think about management of any condition, I'm always in an exam situation talk about um, uh, the, the options, which are do nothing, uh, observe, medical treatments, or surgical treatments. Those are the four you have to cover. And do nothing is sometimes a treatment option. You know, their observation does not mean that you're not treating the patient. You will still be seeing the patient, and some conditions can improve uh, on their own. So the choice of the surgical procedure, if it comes to that, depends on a number of things. It come, depends on the degree of ectropion, the location of the ectropion, as I said, the laxity of the medial and lateral canthal tendons, the laxity of the eyelid, the tone of the orbicularis muscle, the nature of any cystitutional forces, the presence of any mechanical forces, and generally uh, the age and general health of the patient. So we always look at one, um, the patient-related factors, and two, the disease-related factors whenever we're uh, thinking about a uh, potential treatment. So the, the procedures that you could uh, implement in, um, uh, in the management of a lower lid are, are vast. Um, I'll just list them for you uh, and you can read them at your own leisure and practice them at, the, at your leisure with your uh, uh, friendly neighborhood uh, oculoplastic surgeon. Um, <clears throat> these are things like retropunctal cautery if it's very limited to the punctum, a medial spindle, a medial spindle, spindle with a, a wedge resection, a medial canthal tendon plication, a medial canthal resection, a lateral wedge resection, a lateral wedge resection with the skin muscle blepharoplasty, uh, the very well-known lateral tarsal strip procedure. You could do a Z-plasty. You could do a, a wedge excision of the eyelid combined with some of the above. You could also do a posterior approach uh, through the conjunctival approach uh, surgery and replace the retractors where they should be, which actually is a very common cause of lower lid malposition. Um, you could do a fascia lata sling, uh, which may be necessary for a patient with a, 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 a facial weakness. Uh, of course, removing a lesion which is pulling on the eyelid and reconstructing that area. You could do a mid facelift. You could do a soft tissue expansion, and there are a number. So you know a number of techniques as I've mentioned. So I'll just come to a picture here of a, another patient who had surgery, and here this patient's having a lateral tarsal strip, and if you look closely, where that blue arrow is pointing. That's actually the uh, retractor's layer that is dehissed from the lower border of the tarsal plate. So the lower border of the tarsal plate, you can see just uh, more, more anteriorly, 
the sort of yellowish hue, and then there's a pinkish area where uh, uh, it's just conjunctiva. The uh, sorry, uh, seal. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Um, uh, when you started that sentence, it, it, your audio broke up. Okay. Um, so uh, this uh, is a picture of a, uh, a patient having a lower eyelid ectropion repair. Um, this is actually not the same patient I've just shown you. So the important thing to be aware of here is how the blue arrow is pointing at the retractors layer, which is dehissed from the uh, lower border of the tarsal plate. And it's sitting further away with a space of conjunctiva, which is the pinkish tissue in between. So in this patient, you will have to uh, reposit the retractors layer, as well as doing the um, um, uh, lateral tarsal strip. And usually retractor plication is necessary in patients who present with frank tarsal ectropion, which is really what this gentleman has on the right side. Um, so you'll have to do a combination of techniques with him. Okay, and that's the end of that case.